program is brought to you by NewsWorks in cooperation with the City of Eau Claire. This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Without microphone, we're having some trouble with microphone. Uh, I call to order this regular meeting of the Eau Claire County uh, Board of Supervisors on this Tuesday, September the 17th. 17th. Thank you. Tuesday, the 17th. Uh, supervisors, uh, please rise for the honoring of the flag and a moment of reflection by Supervisor Judy Gaffin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. September 21 is the United Nations sanctioned holiday, International Day of Peace, to commemorate and strengthen the ideals of peace, both within and among all nations and peoples. The International Day of Peace is also a day of ceasefire, personal or political. A Piece of My Mind is a colorful collaboration of interviews and photographs by UWEC journalist graduate John Noltner. Exploring the meaning of peace one story at a time, Noltner simply asks each person what peace means to him or her. All the pages in the book are quite compelling, but I chose the response of Judy and Fred Barron to share. Judy's response. It wasn't a community. It was a bunch of people who were afraid to be dead the next minute. There could be no peace in a place like that. Fred's response. I have hope that we learn from each other, that each generation learns from the previous one. I do realize that the learning process is difficult and has its ups and downs. But we have learned so much. We have achieved so much in our relatively short human existence. We can send a man to the moon and bring him back. We are routinely sending objects around the globe. We have stations in our space. We can build atomic bombs and atomic research centers and atomic installations for good and for bad. We can take the organs out from one person and place them into another to give them life. We have done unimaginable things. We have created tiny little objects and apertures that can talk to us. They can do things mathematically and scientifically that took people a generation, and they can do this in a matter of seconds. So we have reduced time and space and effort and whatnot. But in the way we relate to each other in a personal way, person to person and people to people, progress is much more difficult and much slower. That is what we have to strive for. Fred and Judy Barron are survivors of Nazi death camps. They met after they were liberated from the camps and were recovering in a hospital in Sweden. They moved to America, got married, and started a family. They recall the ab absolute absence of peace in the camps and how they found peace again in their lives. Both Fred and Judy feel strongly that it is our obligation to look after one another in this world, especially those who are less fortunate than ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Super Thank you Supervisor Gatlin. I'd like to point out to the county board that I am a living proof of the miracles of modern medicine. <laughs> okay. Tonight's meeting will be broadcast on Valley Media Works, Charter Channel 994 on Thursday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. following the meeting, WFRPLP 101.9 FM and online at valleymediaworks.org. The next item on our agenda is call of the roll, and I think we are able to do that now. I don't think there are any people doing that right now. Looks like there's just one missing, and then Mr. Buchanan. Okay. So just, we, have, just give me one we have one absent and one vacant position. While uh, Janet is checking on that, two? Backfield? Two oh, and Chilson. One back there. He's probably on his way in. Who's coming? Okay. It'll take just a moment to do this. Um, I would take this moment to update you on what we're doing regarding the vacant position which uh, Supervisor Buchanan left. We are about to publish the public notice of the open position. That should come out within the next five or six days. And uh, there will be an end point to that open application. 
Uh, at that point, um, uh, I will interview the candidates. They will meet with the Committee on Administration. Committee on Administration will make a recommendation. I believe I do an appointment and then I bring it before the County Board for approval. So I'm hoping that this can be done before, uh, before the end of October, possibly even before our second meeting in October. So just so you're aware. Where are we, Janet? I'm, I'm going to proceed. So assuming that we've done our call to order and our roll call, our next item is approval of the Journal of Proceedings of August 20th, 2019. A motion by Supervisor Leary. I am assuming your motion is to approve. Supervisor, okay. Second, Supervisor Wilkie. Uh, we do this by voice vote. Any changes, deletions, corrections? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed by nay. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, next item on our agenda is public comment. We have two individuals who wish to present uh, public comment. I'm going to call forward uh, Sarah Ferber first <laughs> and ask David Carlson to be ready on the side. Thank you. Uh, just please identify yourself. And yep. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Ferber, and I live at 612 East Grand Avenue. And I'm here this evening to speak on behalf of the resolution in support of Wisconsin draft le legislation, Reference Bureau LRB Bill 1522, or file number 19-20-057. It's the last item on your guys' agenda this evening. So you guys have heard me speak a lot about my story. So tonight I want to talk, speak on behalf of a woman named Lynette Meyer. Lynette lives in on the north side of Eau Claire, near Eddie Lane. She lives in Eau Claire County, and she is a uh, treatment court graduate. She graduated from drug court in June of 2015. She's on probation, and she'll be on probation until 2022. Lynette currently cannot vote. Um, Lynette owns a home. And something I would like to just kind of put in your mind, that this country was built on the premise of no taxation without representation. And currently, Lynette is being taxed without being represented, based on who she believes should be represented, she should be represented by. Lynette um, rescues dogs, and she, and she fosters them back to health, and then adopts them out to people. She volunteers at Eau Claire County Humane Association, and she volunteers for our Eau Claire County Restorative Justice Program. So she gives back, and she has been giving back for quite a few years. You know, it's been, she basically graduated from drug court when I started drug court. So I can vote now. I've been able to vote since this last winter. And Lynette still cannot vote and won't be able to vote for another three years. So I asked Lynette how she felt about this. And her, her statement was mainly she feels like she can't be heard. Like her opinion perspective doesn't matter. And it's especially frustrating in her local and state elections where she is going to be directly impacted by the result. She hasn't been able to vote since April of 2013, and she won't be able to vote again again until May 2022. And she hasn't committed a crime since November 2013. Now, it could be debated whether you know, these long probation sentences are effective or not, but I know Lynette personally, and I know that, again, she's been giving back to this community for quite some time. And I think that we should really be considering Lynette's opinion on who runs for local and state office. And we should really be considering Lynette's story when we're thinking about this last file number when you guys are voting for whether or not to pass this resolution this evening. So again, um, we, you guys will hear more about this and you'll be able to hear what Judiciary and Law Committee believes. Um, but tomorrow we're going, as, as Expo will be going down to the state state capitol to speak on behalf to our, our local legislature or our state legislature to ask them to pass this so we can get people who are living in our communities, who are paying taxes, who are working, raising their children, they're impacted who, who um, runs and, and is elected to county board, their children are impacted by that. And I really believe that they should have a voice in who those people are. So I hope, based on what I said tonight and other things, that you guys will vote on behalf of this resolution to show the state that Eau Claire County also believes that these folks should have a voice in their elections. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carlson. Mm 
Hi, my name is David Carlson. I am also a member of Expo. I am going to be speaking on Bill 1522-P1, um, restoring voting rights to people on probation and parole. I am currently on supervision uh, for crimes I committed in 2010 and then in 2014 failed on supervision and was locked back up. After that, got out in 2016 and have not offended since. Um, since that time, I have graduated from UWEC. I've um, got my bachelor's, bachelor's in English, my legal studies certificate, and um, have been involved in a, a numerous different criminal justice, um, cr criminal justice uh, movements, trying to help with the criminal justice system, sorry. Um, so what I wanted to talk about, though, was about, so my dad was, I'm a veteran, my dad was a veteran, I'm an Iraq vet, um, two tours in Iraq, my dad was a Vietnam vet. Uh, my dad was born in Mississippi, raised in Mississippi, and uh, came back from Vietnam, I, be I believe, in 1970. Uh, my dad came back. He'd been shot in the face and had injuries to his, both of his legs and his feet. Um, suffers from PTSD from that time up until now. My dad has never recovered. Um, has been in, in and out of institutions, has been locked up, and um, it basically it, it's taken over his life. He, so still to this day, he's, he's not a functioning member of society. Um, one thing that my dad dealt with in 1970 when he came back from Vietnam was his, it was his inability to vote. At that time in uh, Mississippi, it wasn't because the law didn't protect him, it was because where his home was, the Ku Klux Klan would have stopped him, prevented him from going to the ballot. And it was already known that blacks were not allowed to vote. So it wasn't even a consideration in his mind or the mind of his family. Um, my, my father grew up disenfranchised from the voting system his entire life, and it's not even a consideration in his mind. I mention that because um, since I first got in trouble after my second deployment in, in Iraq, um, I also am diagnosed with PTSD um, at 70 percent through the VA. Um, since my second deployment, I have also, or 2010, I have also been uh, disenfranchised from the voting system. I voted before that, um, took place mostly at national level elections, but at this time now I've become more interested in community elections. I've canvassed, I've been a lot more involved in um, politics just because it concerns me and it concerns a lot of people that I care about. Um, the appearance of my situation, it, it strikes me it's kind of sad, and I get very frustrated with my situation because it reminds me of my dad in every way. It may be a different scenario, um, the laws may be different, the times may be different, and the consequences of me trying to vote may also be different. But nevertheless, the results or the reality is the same. I can't vote. I have no voice. There is no reason, there is no incentive for politicians to hear me. There is no incentive for them to try to vote in any way in accordance to the demographic that I represent because I have no voice, I have no vote, I cannot help them. Um, so things like me being on supervision until 2027, like I said, I am a graduate of UWEC. I hold employment, I own a house, I pay taxes for that house and that property. Um, I've done a lot of things since getting out. One of the things that, that I continue to do just because it's something that I do and it helps me um, remain steady in my recovery is help others that are either recovering from substance abuse or trying to get out of this cyclical nature of the criminal justice system. Um, I do that because it helps me. but. Through doing that, I am adding back to society. So not only do I pay taxes, I also dedicate my time outside of my work and outside of the things that I do to earn a living to help others pull themselves up as I have, yet I still cannot vote. So I think this is a very serious issue, regardless of the intentions behind um, keeping people on probation and supervision from voting. We have to look at what the reality and what the consequences of it is. And the fact that it resembles anything close to what it did in 1970, 1960s, South uh, the southern United States should be something that calls, calls to mind that this is something that needs to change. Um, it doesn't matter what the intentions are, it, remander, it matters what the consequences are and for the consequences for the people that are living through it. Thank you for listening to me. Appreciate it. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Could you get into a vote with our keypads or roll call? The clerk has asked that we uh, do our roll call vote now using your keypad, so please take your keypads in hand and indicate your presence. That's supposed to come up. I think we're still struggling with it. <laughs> now, now it 
took it. You can't see it, but if you would, please. I can see it anyway, so. I still have a couple open here. Um, Gibson, have you? Can you try it again, please? Yeah, please. And who's the other one? Um, Pagonis, please. Chilson, please. Just roll call. Lavelle, would you please record your vote? Or not your vote, yeah, roll call. And Knight and Dunning, could you confirm? Okay, thank you. Is that everyone? So we have two missing and yeah, one, one vacant. And two missing, so. All right, so we have six. we have 26 present, two absent, and one vacant. Mm -hmm. The next item on our agenda is the reports of the county board under 2.04.320. First oral reports. Uh, the first report we have on our list is the, the jail data blitz report by Ruth Kranji. But is she? Is Ruth here? We don't, we don't see her. Okay, I'm going to go ahead in the in the agenda, and maybe we can put that to another meeting. Uh, the second item under oral reports is the 2019 financial update and 2020 proposed budget. Uh, both uh, our county administrator and our county finance director will be presenting. Uh, I think what we're going to do on this is have the presentation and then have the opportunity for dis question or discussion, rather than do it during the presentation. Sorry, let me stick with all budget stuff. You could if you want. It's as you wish. Oh, I'll let you start. No. How do I get it? Your problem. Think. Set the projector to. There it is. There it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've been before the board on a number of occasions previously to talk about the financial statements. We've uh, talked about revenue, expenditures, fund balance. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about is cash. Uh, so I'm here this evening to uh, talk about cash. Now, cash is a perspective that's much more tangible and simplistic, but yet uh, extremely important and uh, unfortunately uh, sometimes gets, gets overlooked. So I'm here to provide a little perspective on where we're at with cash, uh, both historically uh, as well as in uh, kind of the near future. Yeah, you did it. Oh. Okay. So... Um, at a high level, uh, historically, uh, for the county, the period of September to kind of late October uh, is where the cash balance of the county is usually at its lowest level. And that's kind of historically or traditionally been because the county has done the borrowing at the end of October, and so those bond proceeds, which have been running about $10 million, typically come in at the very end of October. So what happens is during the calendar year, you're spending on those capital improvement projects only to kind of essentially fund uh, those projects, if you will, at the end of the year. Um, unfortunately, what's happened over the years is we have a number of things that have happened with the county that unfortunately are all kind of heading in the wrong direction and are impacting uh, cash. And, and some, some of those things, so we have uh, you know, cumulative operational deficits in, in DHS you know, largely uh, underfunding of alternate care, coupled with uh, lagging WIMCR receipts for a program that we've heard has been growing pretty dramatically, and, and we'll talk about WIMCR in a little more detail. And that's just on top of the normally inherent cash flow that we have that with our grants and aids, whereby we typically spend those expenditures for grants and aids to get reimbursed later. And so the funding from the county, we have about $35 million of grants and aids. And again, a large chunk of those 
have what I'll call essentially a negative cash flow. You spend the money first on an expenditure basis and then get reimbursed later uh, in the cycle. Um, to put a little bit more of a context than that, because all of these have an impact on the cash balance, just to talk a little bit about the uh, alternate care um, underfunding, if you will. So if I just look at that element and we just look at the last three and a half years as an example, that equates to about $7 million of cash. Now, all of these elements kind of fall into kind of one or two categories. One category is a permanent cash reduction. Okay, so that's the case of alternate care where if we exceed our expenditures and we have no additional funding, those are permanent cash reductions. That cash is never gonna come back. Okay, that's a little bit different than what we have with WIMCR. And we talked about WIMCR before. So WIMCR is the uh, Wisconsin Medicaid uh, cost reporting system. Um, we've sometimes, I think, referred to it as the CCS uh, gap funding, if you will, but it's that extra funding that we get that's kind of the difference between what we're paying uh, a provider for a service, say, in a contracted service, what we're getting uh, reimbursed for at a Medicaid rate, uh, and then that extra funding, if you will, is part of that WIMCR. And to refresh your memory, that WIMCR that we get is somewhere between one and two years, if you will. So on average, about 18 months different from the expenditure. So the WIMCR that we had for 2018, we will get in December of 2019. Okay, so why is that an issue? Well, one, it's an issue because of that reason, but second, during the year of, say, 2019, for example, we're funding both last year's WIMCR amount plus the 2019 WIMCR amount. Okay, so that amounts to about $3 million right now that the county is funding that's waiting for it, basically that cash to come in. Okay, um, I say that because I wanna make it clear that as we continue to grow the CCS program and the WIMCR numbers, that during most of any given year, the county will be funding two years worth of WIMCR, if you will, at a time. So let's just say, for sake of argument, we get to around a $2.5 million number on average and things level out. That means for a large part of any given year, we'll be funding about $5 million of cash that's purely related to timing. And so to put a little perspective on that, WIMCR in 2017 was about $500,000. 2018, it was about $1.3 million. 2019, I'd say we're gonna be pushing near $2 million. And I'd say 2020, if we look at the budget, is probably closer to 2.4 million. Now those are projections yet for 19 and 20, but if you look at kind of where we're at and you look at the growth of the program, those are the kind of numbers that we'll be talking about that will essentially kind of tie up cash, okay? All of those things have now had uh, kind of the cumulative effect along with where we're at with just 2019 to basically necessitate that we need to take uh, a, a much shorter kind of tactical perspective on cash until we get those bond proceeds at the end of October. Uh, in a couple slides I'll show you a chart and we'll be able to see kind of what that kind of means historically and, and what we're projecting. So in response, we've initiated a number of initiatives. Uh, uh, the short-term initiatives are, are very tactical in nature. So there are things like uh, we're having more detailed cash forecasting from our larger departments. We're looking at what expenditures could be delayed, uh, future expenditures delayed if possible, potentially delaying a payment if we could uh, work it out and the timing is correct. Um, and then in just general, continue to educate all departments uh, and all the stakeholders of, of what's going on with cash in the county. In addition to that, we need to really look hard at long-term uh, initiatives as well, but that's a much more strategic perspective that this board will have to um, essentially address um, because as you will see when we get to the, the chart, this is not just a short-term problem. Because of those cumulative impacts that we've had, it's both a short-term short -term and a long-term problem. So it's gonna have to be addressed from, from both perspectives, but we're um, actively addressing the short-term uh, initiatives. So the bottom line is, 
overall, you know, the county just doesn't have as large a cash balance um, as it once had. Um, I would say probably historically over the years, cash has not been something that's been discussed. It's probably not something that's been uh, necessarily gotten a lot of attention because the county had a large enough cash balance, it could kind of weather these storms. Uh, but you know, that's, that's not really the case of where we're at now. So this situation didn't occur overnight, but it is a situation that now uh, needs uh, attention. Uh, one of the analogies I've used in, in some of the committees that I've talked to, it's, it's a little like a, a perspective if you think about it, when you lower the level of a lake, uh, eventually the rocks will appear. And I'd say we're kind of in that situation where we've lowered the level of the lake over years and now those rocks are starting to appear. So, so let's talk about where we think we're gonna be in September of this year, which is again traditionally kind of that low point uh, versus where we were a year ago. So right now the, the treasurer's uh, projecting that our cash balance for September 2019 is gonna be somewhere between eight and nine million dollars lower than it was September of 2018. Uh, I wanna emphasize two things here. One, it is a projection, um, and I wanna emphasize that because uh, as the next bullet point states, because cash I think hasn't necessarily been a perspective that's been talked about and has actually uh, been in the forefront, um, a lot of the county systems, if you will, and the processes, uh, the ability to forecast cash, to have visibility to cash, both receipts and, and uh, disbursements, really doesn't exist, okay? So we have to rely on projections, and that's just one of the initiatives we're looking at in the short term, is getting very tactical on what those short-term cash projections are now. What do we expect coming in for receipts? What do we expect going out for disbursements? And then looking at that from this period now to the end of October, because the bond proceeds will come in around October 30th, okay? Um, so you might ask, well, how could we be eight to nine million dollars different just uh, one year to the next? And I've only outlined a few of these just to kind of uh, put some perspective to it. First one is, you know, there's just a larger DHS negative cash flow, if you will, from where we're at in 2018 to where we're at in 2019. Now certainly a part of that is that growing Wimker reimbursement that we talked about. Some of it, I'm sure, is due to, to alternate care and other things that we've talked about. Uh, but again, I'm taking a very simplistic approach, if you will. This is what cash is coming in the door and what cash is going out the door, okay? I'm not looking at whether we have a surplus or deficit. This is purely looking at a cash perspective. The next one is we actually have higher CIP expenditures. Now, CIP is the Capital Improvement Program, so this is traditionally that capital that I talked about in terms of what are we borrowing for in the bond resolution that you're gonna be discussing later this evening. Typically, you know, you hope that that's a little bit linear. We've actually, at this point in the year, we spent $1.2 million um, ahead of what we would have spent last year at the same time. So that's drawn the cash balance down another $1.2 million. Um, the highway cash flow is about 0.7 million of that difference. Uh, this is another example, I guess you could say is good news, bad news. Good news is the highway commissioner has been able to do projects uh, a little bit sooner than he did last year, uh, which is good and actually is, uh, provides some, for some more efficiency. The bad news is he doesn't get the funding till later. Uh, so it's again another one of those timing issues, uh, but it is something we need to, again, take into account when we're looking at it. And then lastly, just overall general receipts are, are down about half a million. Now that only totals about $6 million, but at least I think provides the board a little bit of perspective of the kind of things that can drive how you can go from uh, 2018 to 2019 and drop potentially another eight to nine million in, on a projected basis, okay? And, and obviously going forward, Cash is gonna to have to be a quarterly financial update. Uh, one of the initiatives is gonna to have to be to uh, really to expand both the education and the visibility to all stakeholders. So when I mean that, I mean uh, the board, uh, employees, um, all the people involved in that process. Um, it's gonna likely involve, we're gonna to have to do probably some additional negotiations with our larger suppliers, for instance. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives that we can look at some are gonna be short-term, some will be long-term. 
Okay. Uh, one last slide. Um, hope you can uh, kind of see this. Uh, this is what the cash balances look like on a quarterly basis. Okay. Uh, a few things to take away from the grass, graph. Uh, the very end, if you will, are in September 2019. This goes from September of 2016 to September of 2019. You'll see that we're projecting that 10 to $11 million. You'll see that if you look at it kind of historically, again, from 16 through 19, that that September really is kind of our low point. And again, we've somewhat created that by doing the bond proceeds in October. Uh, but again, it's historically kind of where that low point is, and so that's the point we have to be able to make sure we are looking at both those peaks and valleys. The other thing, I guess, that's probably um, uh, a little bit more uh, cause for concern, if you will, is, oh, I guess the chart's not up, um, is if you look at the trend line, okay, we have, this is again part of what I'm talking about, this is a short term and a long term problem. Short term, we have a problem that we need to make sure we have additional cash management, if you will, between now and the end of October, which is that September number. Long term, what you're seeing is a trend of cash that's gone down over that, that three-year period, if you will. Um, that's going to take some additional discussion. It's going to take uh, discussion and, and uh, understanding by the board and strategic direction that you want to take. Uh, it's going to be something that's going to have to be addressed on a more long-term basis. So we can do things to modify cash in the short term. We can do things like potentially pull in the timing of when we're doing the bonding and the bond proceeds. But as I mentioned once before, when you, you know, drain the, the level of the, lower the level of the lake, if you will, the rocks start to appear. We've lowered that overall level of the lake such that we don't have as quite the capacity as we once had to be able to weather some of those, um, I say peaks and valleys, but particularly the valleys. Um, and especially when they're coming in kind of the September time frame or, um, or you know, that could actually move in earlier, so. Any questions? Uh, I would like to hold those. Oh, you want to hold have those? Have to okay. staff report and then have oh, discussion okay. and questions. I guess I missed here. Norb, stay there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Norb, for the financial update on cash. Um, this evening, I also have information for you regarding the 2020 proposed budget. The next number of slides will recap the 2020 budget for you very briefly and give an overview of the timeline and the next steps in the budget cycle. What you see here is the actual timeline and again ways for you as individual supervisors to become engaged in the budget process. You will be able to review in detail the administrator's recommendations, also the materials that were prepared at the department level online, and we'll take a little bit of time just to show you how to navigate those electronically at the end of this presentation. At the October 15th meeting, you will actually see the recommendation from Finance and Budget. Finance and Budget takes a significant amount of time to review the recommendation and to meet with departments and identify a policy direction that they would like to recommend to the board. And so you will see that coming forward at that October meeting. We've also included the listing of the different meetings for Finance and Budget. So if you have a specific topic, where you would like to listen to that dialogue, you'll be able to do so. And then you will also have opportunity to participate in the budget amendment process. That actually occurs after you have the final result from finance and budget. Those materials will be available to you. We will have them available online between October 15th and October 31st, and they are the documents where if you as an individual supervisor would like to propose an amendment to the budget as proposed, you're able to do so. What we've done very briefly here is um, placed all the different departmental units within the areas of public service that the county provides services within 
And each one of these gives a very brief overview of the actual changes in each one of those areas. And as, I, as you'll note, they are very brief with a few slight changes that are offered for your review. I would encourage you actually to go online if you want to see more detail and actually, again, all of the individual departmental budget requests are on our website as well. And so you see a number of our health and human services in this area. Transportation and public works, of course, highway, recycling, and our airport. Public safety, I'm not going to read these slides to you. I think you'll be able to do that yourself. And then we're also going to show you where you can see different portions of information that's been summarized in different formats. Our judicial branch. And as you'll note, many of these are simply cost to continue um, budgets that would incorporate any changes in wages and health insurance and supplies and services and increases in those areas. And this will be on the website as well. General government, it actually incorporates many of the behind the scenes activities that do not provide direct service to clients, but actually support those units that do support our community directly. And again, most of those again are uh, cost to continue or slight reductions. There's also a summary of our capital requests as well as our debt. The things that I would like to point out to you in the capital request are, first of all, that our technology infrastructure, vehicle replacement, and much of our ongoing infrastructure maintenance, that is the actual maintenance to our physical buildings, is actually accomplished through capital. And without that, um, we would have difficulty meeting those equipment needs, whether it's sheriff's squad cars, laptops. Um, there's a significant investment that's made through the capital for those items. This budget proposal also includes an investment of additional LED as a way of upgrading all of our light fixtures. The overall return on investment for that type of a, a change out is between two and three years in cost savings from a utility standpoint. And so that is why you see that item being recommended. Under debt, our new debt issuance is actually 9.55. We try to keep it below that 10 million so that um, we remain bank qualified. And the actual amount total is 9.55 million. The debt service levy is the amount that we are paying on the debt from prior years. And so that's the overall payment that we're making. And right now our debt service is actually 10% of our overall budget. That is the budget as it pertains to all expenditures that we make, not just levy funded expenditures. A couple of the assumptions that we used when putting this budget together are summarized here. Um, we are assuming that the vehicle registration fee will remain flat at 2.3 million sales tax flat at the prior year of 10.8 million. There are some fee increases throughout. There will be a detailed uh, revenue report that will also be included on the web if you are interested in looking at that, or you can see the actual increases within the individual budget areas. The amount that we were able to levy this year in net new construction was 1.89%, which was $439,000 approximately. Um, in actual new levy dollars. And the mill rate um, is $4 and, if you round up, $0.09. Cents. Um, that was mitigated somewhat because our equalized valuation is growing at a rate that is higher than the rate or the of our expenditures. And right now, when we look at the overall grant funding, our Comprehensive Community Services grant funding is one of our most significant grant fund sources. Expenditures, our health insurance, we kept the increase at 6.6%. There was a slight modification to deductible limits in order to arrive at that 6.6%. The budget does include step increases as well as 1% cost of living. 
Um, we're slightly behind right now the Chippewa Valley, which is about three to four percent overall for the changes in the overall um, schedule, salary schedule structure. And so um, we were pleased to be able to put the cost of living increase in this budget. Forty-three percent of our budgeted expense is for salaries, wages, personnel-related costs, and we have full-time equivalents of 595.41 individuals or full-time equivalencies. So real quickly, we just wanted to show you how to navigate our online budget documents. So if you will bear with me for one moment. Um, if you go to, and I don't know why that's not showing up. Well, it, the image isn't, the image is on my screen, but it's not, one moment. Here comes your assistant. I've, wait, I got it. I don't know why it changed, but it went off. Thank you. So if you actually want to just take off from your report central, which is actually for supervisors, you have that on your iPad. Um, and otherwise, we can sh show you where that link is. But if you go down to budget resources, you'll see the county budget is right down there at the very bottom. And if you click on county budget, you'll actually have the 2020 county budget information. And what you'll see here are a number of different things. We have the budget message, um, which you have a printed copy of that on your desks. We have summaries, and when you click summaries, there are a number of different summaries to actually choose from. Um, and you'll see that we have a number of the different reports there, and they're categorized so that you can navigate them easily. The nice thing about having them here, if you like to use an electronic resource, is that you can easily move from one summary document to another, because you can click on the um, item and take a look at the chart and then move back and forth between the various items to actually be able to do analysis if you desire to do so. And so all of the materials, capital summary, all of the materials are here on the website um, for you to look at. And the same locations will be used. So finance and budget will do its work. And when it's done with its work, their materials will be located in the same spot. So you don't have to try to figure out, well, I thought I wanted this version, but I really want this version. This will be updated based on the work that finance and budget does so that you will actually see the final results of it as you're looking for um, budget information. We've um, also pulled together the actual survey um, and put that in, for, in a form so that you can actually look at it. And that is the survey that was conducted on our web. Um, we actually had 689 responses, um, which is actually much higher than prior years. So that's a, that's a significant um, response. So the documents are here for you to peruse. In a variety of different forms, you'll note that we have this overall recommended budget summary. You may want to just take some time to look at the various um, recommendations and summaries and documents that are here. If you read through the actual budget message itself, what you will see in the budget message are little um, blue capitalized words, one that says survey. If you click on survey, it will take you directly to the survey. So if that is the way you prefer to look at the budget document, you're able to do that as well. It's meant to be easy to navigate for you so that you can understand what is being proposed. We also have for you section summaries. And again, each one of our governmental <coughs> units for reporting with the state of Wisconsin is lumped together in these summaries. And so you can see some history by each summary area to gain a better understanding of how we actually budget in each of those respective areas. Along with that then, all of the budget detail provided by the departmental areas is also included. And you can actually scroll through those documents and you will see that each one has the, um, the summary information, the overall expenditures and revenues, as well as the 2020 recommended. And then as we move forward again, the finance and budget 
recommendations will be included in here as well as the final adopted numbers so that you will be able to um, follow through the reporting as you're looking at the budget as it moves through the process. And that is all I have. And if the board has questions at this time on either the financial report from the finance director or the budget at all. I guess maybe I'd add one more thing on the budget. So a number of these documents were documents that previously, like last year, showed up in the proposed budget. So what we've done is we've actually accelerated them, pulled mm -hmm. them forward. So now they're all part of uh, earlier in the process for you to review. And so they may look very familiar. That's because they were provided historically at the proposed time as opposed mm -hmm. to now we're moving them to the recommended time to give you more time to, uh, to look at them and mm -hmm. ask questions. And I'd like to verbally thank the finance department and, and uh, Samantha Cole for the work they did to make that happen. It was a significant effort. Questions or discussion? P please use your keypad. Supervisor Gatlin, use your keypads to indicate requests to speak. You're on, Supervisor Gatlin. Okay. I wish to know how, how you measure the 689 responses from our constituents. What do you do with those responses? How do you utilize them when you come up with this budget? Um, well, what I do is I look through the responses and they actually identify in each of the different areas where our constituency feels um, or what they feel are critical issues to address and or not. And so it gives an indication of the overall temperature of our community and what they value. It is not a statistically significant survey instrument, but it does give an indication. And I think that we typically see the same types of services being valued by our community. And they value safety, and that is safety from a public safety standpoint in the services that the sheriff provides. They value the services in protecting vulnerable populations. Um, they value the services of our highway department and keeping our roadways clean. So actually, if you take some time and look through that, you'll be able to see, because each one of those categories is listed on those survey results, mm -hmm. and then you can see for yourself exactly and that was just a snapshot in time based on putting that out here at this point in time. We can actually refresh that data as well because the survey is still live and active. Thank you. Supervisor Wilkie. Uh, one thing I wanted to follow up on, uh, last year when you talked about uh, doing uh, written amendments, uh, having them done prior, you pointed out uh, something that I think should be pointed out again this year, uh, that staff are more than willing to sit down with you and help you write up that amendment, telling you also the pros and cons. They may or may not agree with your amendment, uh, but they have a, a professional obligation to assist you uh, with that. Mm -hmm. So. I want that to, to be said on the front end because the budget that you will receive from budget and uh, finance, ultimately in the end, it's not budget and finances budget, it's this county board's budget. So you will de decide when we get into the committee the whole. So I certainly encourage you, uh, we don't have a problem with you bringing things forward. I would also point out, however, that does not restrict you from bringing an amendment forward during the budget process um, uh, without it prior being written prior because obviously as you have dialogue or other changes are or are not made, you may decide that you want to make an amendment and you can in do so. So I, d I just wanted to point that out. Uh, on Norb's uh, comments, um, I do want to point out something that you did in committee that uh, I, maybe you said it, but I didn't catch it, uh, that to change the bonding timeline is not without cost. It would cost us more to move that timeline up. Um, yeah, there certainly would be, you know, an increase in uh, interest expense. 
Uh, now, as a reminder, that does all get calculated as part of the debt levy, debt service levy. So it would be one of those things that would be added to the county levy. But yes, there would be an increased uh, additional cost of interest. Okay. Two other things uh, that I wanted to uh, touch on, to draw out that uh, uh, you you uh, pointed out in, in committee that as we continue to draw down our fund balance substantially year after year going down that slippery slope um, that uh, there is a also a revenue loss to, that we lose interest on what we originally would have had in the bank had we not done the upfront paying plus the overage is that we're experiencing in the county. I think the board needs to be made aware of that as well. Okay, so I will replay that what I think you're saying. So that chart was again the cash balance. Okay, so not the fund balance, just so we're yeah. on the same page. Uh, a certain amount of that cash, the treasurer does invest when she can, uh, and the county does rely on that as additional revenue in the form of interest uh, income. This year, that interest income will amount to about four hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars it's she uh, was able to get some favorable rates early on but again it's very dependent upon interest rates as well as the amount uh, we are looking at the budget next year where we've had to cut that back and that's partially because of the two factors the cash balance available to be able to invest at a given time and unfortunately the degradation of interest rates that are also occurring so yes there's a there's a corresponding also revenue impact of just the cash balance on average going down. The final thing on that slippery slope <laughs> that we're yeah. going down, um, I have 100% uh, confidence in uh, my colleagues on budget and finance that we must and we will turn that slope around. I have confidence in our staff that they're acknowledging it and we must and we will turn it around. And I'm having confidence in all 29 of us that when we do budgets, it's going to be painful, some things that we're going to have to decide, but it, we must turn that slope around. Because my question to you, Norb, how many years will it take before we're going to hit zero? Well, I certainly don't want to speculate, but uh, uh -huh. it is a it is certainly a, a cause for concern on the, the trending the trending down. Uh, just to put some additional perspectives for you so you understand what do we have in a ca from a cash flow perspective. Uh, an average payroll runs about a million dollars every two weeks. Our weekly disbursements where our, you know, our check runs, if you will, run anywhere from one million to three million every week. Okay, just to, again, provide some context. Now, obviously, we still have, as we've mentioned, revenues coming in. Part of why I again wanted to emphasize its projection is because we don't always have very good visibility on one of those receipts coming in and the expenditures and so um, that also comes into play when the treasurer is able to decide how much money can I invest uh, in a CD or some interest bearing instrument because she needs to be able to have liquidity to be able to um, you know fund operations so yeah. um, again I we didn't get into the situation overnight uh, we're not going to get out of it overnight. Uh, it's what I want you to take away, though, is in the short term, I believe we're actively addressing what we need to do. Um, and I think we're by bringing it to this board and to everyone that we can in terms of all the stakeholders, I think we'll clearly address the long term initiatives and strategies that we'll need. So it's certainly cause for concern, but um, I think at this point in time, you know, we're certainly addressing it, and you will see me before you on a regular basis updating everyone where cash is because it now needs to be part of our conversation, even though it hasn't been in the past. Supervisor Wilkie? No, um, that's okay. all I have. Uh, Supervisor Chilson. Thank you. Uh, my first question or statement I'm going to have is going to be related to fund balance. I would I think anyway so my question is the amounts we've set up for WIMCR which is a payable uh, or a receivable receivable, receivable yeah. that we're gonna get mm -hmm. how accurate 
is the amount that we've set up. And my question there is, is the amount open to interpretation? Is there, the, the more you work or massage the number, the better you can make other figures look. Is the number we've set up that we anticipate getting, which will then go back directly to cash, because mm -hmm. that's where it'll go, mm -hmm. is it realistic? Are we gonna get that number or are we gonna come up several hundred thousand short? Okay, I'll address the question the best I can, which is we have one year of experience. And in that one year of experience, I'd say we're fairly close to what that Wimker payment was for that year of 2017. 2018, it's 1.3 million. Um, we went through, I believe, although this is a more, should be addressed to the DHS uh, um, fiscal, if you will, but I guess I have confidence that, that it will be close to that number based on our one year of experience, but it's very limited experience. So you're right, I think there is still a growing, there's still growing pains, if you will, in that process uh, of, of making sure we have That's everything so appropriately so. uh, represented. And I think the state has a certain amount of play into what that number is as well, but based on the one year of experience, I. I would expect it to be very close. And we'll get that money in December? So very we'll end of know, December. Last year we'll it came in. We'll know exactly in, where we're at in December? Yeah. Yeah, December it came in very close to the end of the year. And I would expect it to be the same. And, and so, you know, that, that again is anyone who's in this program experiences that. I think what we have here is a situation where this program has grown dramatically, and it's also coming at a time where we're having other potential cash struggles. And so, as I mentioned, we have two elements. We have cash that permanently is a reduction, and then we have timing. And to carry another three or four or five million dollars, again, depending on where where the, the final Wimker number lands, I think that's a bit of an unknown, right? I think we've talked about that. Where will it level off? It might be another year or two before that starts to level off, and at what level would that be? That's a lot of money for any county to carry, if you will, um, and, and it's particularly uh, problematic for us when you're at a position where um, we have less overall cash reserves to deal with. So. so the second part of my comment then will be at our meeting the other day, we talked about what level of financial severity we were going to talk about in the presentation to mm -hmm. the board. I guess I think we should and I was hoping you'd touch a little bit more on the severity of it, and I'm gonna reference what the, what the treasurer said in that was she was anticipating at the end of October that we could be down to as low as $4 million in the bank. And she had told us about mm -hmm. the payroll runs of a million dollars, and you just alluded to mm -hmm. that the weekly checks are anywhere between one and three million. Mm -hmm. The second part of that that she said was that she was not sure if we would be able to sustain ourselves, even with the the capital money coming in from the bonding, that by the end of before the end of January, that we wouldn't be able or wouldn't have to do some sort of short-term borrowing to cover ourselves in that time. And I, I was hoping you'd touch on that, because I mean, we're at four yeah. at the end of October. There's a very real possibility, and she's the one that does the numbers. She's yeah. the one that said that. Yeah, I, I, I guess I don't want to necessarily speak to that and, you know, uh, but I, I think, again, it's something we have to keep in front of us at all times now. Like I said, cash has to be part of our conversation going forward. Um, in the private sector, one of the phrases I, I would hear quite, quite frequently, I guess, if you will, was cash is king. Well, cash is king. Um, everything runs on cash. Uh, and so we have to be very uh, conscious of that, and we need to make sure we keep that in front of everyone. And, and that would include making sure that we're looking at cash not just to the end of October when we get those bond proceeds, but even going forward after that. So if we got into a situation where there was short-term borrowing, we're certainly not the first county that's experienced that, and I'm sure we won't be the last. Um, but it is an important milestone or step that you know we certainly want to avoid if we can. So I think we have certain things we can do 
to make sure we're monitoring that and, and doing what we can, but we do have to keep that absolutely in front of everyone. So just to recap though, I mean, in, in your what your presentation was tonight and what we talked about the other night, if our situation reaches a point where it's a serious, serious crisis, one of the options that we're considering is delaying payment to vendors to be able to cover the, the shortfall of cash mm -hmm. that we do not have. Sure, I think we have to absolutely look at our, our vendor payments. We have to look at our vendor payment terms. Um, we have to look at our larger vendors and see if we uh, should negotiate different payment terms, something that clearly is done on a very active basis in the private sector. I don't know why it would be any different necessarily in the public sector. Um, I think those are all things you, that you have to look at. Um, you have to basically leave no stone un uh, unturned in terms of what you need to do. Um, again, we could do other things, like I said about, we talked about, you know, moving the bond proceeds. That's, again, a, a uh, it's a long-term but kind of tactical perspective. It still has to, you still have to turn the corner, as Supervisor Wilkie said, and we need to replenish the balances um, but, you know, I, I think we need to certainly keep it in front of us. Supervisor Chilson? Uh, uh, I'm good. Done, okay. Uh, Supervisor Russell? Um, I had a question about the budget um, and budget amendments. Last year, um, there were some made at the floor at the last minute, sort of because there seemed to be a lack of awareness about a program being cut. So when we're going through the department budgets, it, will it be really clear any programming or services that are being cut? The place it, to actually look for that is in the budget summary where it identifies if there are any changes in actual um, okay. programming. Um, and it gives just a very brief descriptor of what the change, what the recommended amount is and what the change is. And you'll see that same document when finance and budget is done with their work that will identify any potential changes. Okay, thank so you. So you'll be able to see that. Supervisor Russell. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other request to speak. Thank you very much. Oh, excuse me. Supervisor Stelch says your keypad not working. I, I did push it, but. I'm sorry. We're having some problems tonight with the system. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions for both of you. Catherine, maybe I'll start with you. The, the simplest one is, uh, do county employees uh, fill out the survey? They may. Uh, now, whether or not they do, I can't answer, but they are, of course, able to do so. Many of them are also citizens and sure. residents of the county. And actually, we don't have geographical limits on it, so we may even have individuals who aren't necessarily in Eau Claire County that sure. fill out our survey. Okay. The numbers just struck me if we had 689 responses and 550 employees. I just wonder what the overlap is. Oh. I don't know. Um, Okay, second question for you is contingency planning. And part mm -hmm. of this was prompted by a piece I was listening to on the radio uh, this evening, but I think we all have to assume that pretty soon we'll experience some sort of an economic downturn. We've been on a 10-year positive run. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in having some discussion during the budget process as to what our flexibility is. Let's suppose we have a, a recession, an economic downturn. What costs do we save? Do we incur additional costs? What likely revenue would we lose? And how would we react to that? And I, I know nobody has a crystal ball, but I think there ought to be at least some space devoted in the budget to talking about what our ability to react to that is. If in terms of reaction, so for instance, we actually left our sales tax flat this year um, with because it, it's volatile anyhow. And then with some of the volatility that we're seeing in the economy, that's a recommendation right now, is that we would leave that amount flat. 
Um, as it pertains to other revenue sources, one of the things that you often see, and it's not really as revenues as much because the revenues are not necessarily tied to the economy per se, but what we often see is a higher demand for some of the services that we provide. And so I think that that actually poses potentially a greater risk from a county perspective because in many of our areas, as you saw from some of our uh, charts and graphs, we're already somewhat inundated with requests for different types of service. And we have a number of service lines where the volume of requests coming in far exceeds our ability to serve. So that will have to be part of the dialogue as we move into the 2020 budget. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we ought to at least talk about our vulnerability in mm -hmm. that regard. Okay. Uh, Nor a couple for you here, and I know Supervisor Chilson touched on some of this, but I'm still always confused about the difference between fund balance and cash balance. Can you give a simple explanation of that? Uh, well, I'll try. Um, so if you think about a fund balance, fund balance is uh, because we talk about that one as part of our financials and our year-end financials, includes a, includes a certain amount of accruals. Uh, so, for instance, um, one of the things that we do because of the lag of revenue is the DHS revenue is actually held open f until June pertaining to the previous year. So that would count as kind of a receivable as it, part of a fund it, balance. That's right. So it would show up as revenue okay. in the preceding year and impact the actual financials and fund balance wouldn't impact the cash because then that's coming in the following year okay. all those get yeah so that that's all right so I it's kind of like cash plus cash plus accruals, receivables if you or will, accruals. yeah, yeah. Okay. and it also the fund balance also takes into account non-cash charges like depreciation right okay. so you have to you know there's other non-cash charges that flow through there okay so a couple meetings ago we also voted not to do an external review on dhs i if i remember correctly Oh, well, okay. Yeah. So I'm wondering, what is our level of confidence that we haven't missed billing somebody for something uh, that we should, you know, to explain this deficit? Even with your big hit items there, we're still a couple million short. So, I mean, I think if I were in a private sector, I'd ask myself, geez, did I miss anything? Did I forget to bill somebody mm -hmm. for something? I, my only closer reference is in Parks and Forest, and I know it's, pretty loose how that goes. Somebody could forget to bill somebody, and I don't think, mm -hmm. you know, with through no intention, mm -hmm. an accident could happen. Do we, can that happen in DHS? Uh, can it happen in property tax collection? What is our confidence level that we have actually billed everybody for everything that we have billed? So that's the first part. And then the second part of that question is, tracking of receivables, and I know you and I have had this discussion, mm -hmm. we don't keep an actual register or an open account receivable. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's some sideline spreadsheets or whatever, but for example, I don't think invoices that we've sent to foresters are on any receivable at all, mm -hmm. and I don't think we have any cash collection method. Uh, back to Supervisor Chilson's discussion about how close will we be. Is there a register of the claims against DHS for this, whatever the acronym is, Wimmer? Wimker. Or, yeah. Is there a register where I could go look and say there's, you know, 500 claims out here and we've now I've collected 200 of those? Yeah. Um, so two questions. How do we know we've billed everything? And then how do we track what we've billed and can we get back? Is there room for improvement there? Um, well, I think there's probably more than two questions and all that, but um, let me address that one first. So you're right, receivables is uh, unfortunately one of those things that, that we have that's disconnected. Uh, because the, uh, typically what we do is more of a cash basis, we're not doing some of the, what I'll call more traditional accrual basis items, which would be receivables receivables and payables, it goes both ways, right? We traditionally don't record payables until we're paying them. We don't enter them into the system, if you will, assuming we're gonna pay it 
you know, a month from now, right? So from that perspective, it's quite honestly, from my personal perspective, much different than the private sector, right? And so there are those things like that where we're actually, uh, uh, one of the projects for 2020 is to look at putting receivables on our general ledger system and, and looking at the feasibility of doing that because, as I mentioned, we need more visibility on cash, and that's visibility and receivables and receipts, and it's visibility on expenditures, disbursements, right? So both ways. So some of the initiatives that we're talking about and looking for 2020 include looking at receivables into Alio, also looking at using the system in more traditional, what I'll call kind of traditional accounts payable perspective, where by you enter an invoice when you receive it, and you set up you set it up for when it's going to be paid in the future, 30 days, 45, 60 days, then your system will tell you, oh, you know what, in 30 days I'm gonna be paying this much money, in 45 I'm gonna be paying this, and 60 and that. We're not doing that today. Um, we have struggles with that, uh, not only because we're uh, kind of decentralized from a financial perspective, but also because some of our systems, you know, DHS uses Avatar, they're not using our traditional system. Uh, Highway uses their system, and I'm fortunate. Chems. Okay, thank you. I couldn't remember the name of it. And so we have two of our major cash activity departments are using systems that aren't our centralized accounting system. So that poses challenge. So it won't be that we won't have to seriously look at what we can do there and, and also seriously see if there's a way to integrate those systems. Uh, but those are things we are looking at. Um, in terms of are we absolutely assured we're billing everything, and I can't say that I know that or would have any ability to make an opinion on that. Other than we are, our external auditors, that is part of, of their job to do that uh, and to assess. Is it? Well, I think it is to a certain degree. Um, now, you could argue as to what degree that is, but uh, they do look at things. They look at what our processes are. They do, uh, they certainly look at reasonableness of year to year and what's going on. They, they do assessments of receipts that are come in after the period, and they're looking for unrecorded receipts and unrecorded disbursements. So they have a number of, of standard audit tests that they're doing. Uh, but can I say with certainty that everything? No, I, I, I can't say that. Okay. One f final question. Oh, the target number for cash, is there a target as expressed in like days of operation or something analogous to a quick ratio? I mean, what's the right number? Well, you know, the, the, here's where it gets to be a bit difficult. So we traditionally talk about cash only once a year, and that's in December when it's in the, in the, in the actual financial statements. And that's usually our high point because uh, the treasurer's been able to collect a lot of taxes. Uh, and so it gets a false sense of security, quite honestly. If you were to look at the financial statements and look at the quick ratio, you'd be feeling very good. I come along and I show you this chart, and now you're not feeling so good, right? So it's a point in time, right? Unfortunately, those ratios are done in a point in time, right? Okay, so we need to look at more of a... Or what's a mean? What? Well, we, you, you certainly want to be at, at over one. Right, and the quick ratio is you know current assets over current liabilities. It's, it's are you do you have enough liquidity to pay your your um, your disbursements as they're due, right? In the short term, uh, so certainly you'd want to be over one. Uh, I, I don't have what our magic number should be. It's a much different perspective uh, here because we we also set the budget, and we don't have any. Um, at least we don't so far, I'll say, have a good understanding of the seasonality. We just assume that when we set the budget, everything is linear. Uh, and unfortunately, it isn't linear. <laughs> there are peaks and valleys. Uh, just as there are with cash, there's peaks and valleys in revenues and expenditures. Uh, and we don't have really got enough data to necessarily uh, probably get to that level. I think we can eventually get there as we continue to raise visibility and and make everyone aware. Um, so I, I don't have a magic number. Um, I, I'd okay. say certainly. Well, we the heard, for, like, from what Supervisor Chilson said, yeah. four is probably too low. But four million is probably too low. That, that, when we had 30, we were probably pretty happy. Yep. Somewhere in between there. Yeah. So I, 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 my personal nice perspective is, is, again, 
historically, there's been enough cash that this hasn't been an issue. We, they have probably, I'm suspecting, and many of you have been on the board, obviously, at the time, that cash hasn't exactly been a topic that's been raised and talked about. I'm now saying we, it will be a topic we need to address going forward because it is something we need to keep in front of us. So, um, again, we didn't get here overnight, and we're not going to get out of this overnight, and we just need to keep our diligence and, uh, and keep the visibility and look at what things we can change. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see no other, re oh, sorry, spoke too soon. Supervisor Bates. Uh, thank you. Uh, the one thing we've done over the last number of months is to try to look at some of the reasoning behind the increased amount of funding that has been really going into human services. And obviously, so much of this has to do with the opioid epidemic, the foster children issue, and children in protective services. And as we've looked at that and gone to literally looking at a longer-term solution, obviously that means it's not going to be quick. It's going to take some time to turn that around. Mm. But I do believe you need to keep in mind that also we have positions that are kept open. We're not hiring in certain areas, even though the positions have been approved. And certainly we have very little control as to when the state actually pays us and mm -hmm. the amount that they pay us. We have been underfunded for probably as long as 15 years. <laughs> And if you go back to when the tax levy freeze occurred, that certainly put us in straits. Mm -hmm. When you say, have we had this before? Yeah, we really have. When Dale Southard was indeed the chair of finance, it ended up because there was an issue with cash flow. Uh, they took away all of the reserves that were held within any of the departments, the rainy day funds and they were brought back to a general fund in order that there was that one pot of money that uh, was looked at for everyone's use and not just one's department's use. I think that some of the good news is that basically we can see some early trends in what we're doing in human services. Is that going to be a quick thing? No. But is the indicator such that we're heading in the right direction? I believe that we are. Over the last number of years, you've looked to human services to solve some of our thorniest issues. And uh, it's a staff that right now has a lot of caseload, a lot of responsibility, and a lot of pressure. And obviously, I think we have to be careful that we keep our best and brightest among us mm -hmm. and not make them feel as somehow they are to blame for what's happening, because basically it's far, far beyond their control. Thank you. I think I see no other request to speak. Thank you very much for your report and for your participation, Supervisors. We'll move on now to written reports. You have in your packet the following written reports, the 2019 Contingency Fund Report, the August 2019 payments over $10,000, New Human Resources Policies by link. You have policies 211 and 725. Are there Sorry. Are there any questions or comments about any of the written reports? Okay. Under Section 7, Presentation of Petitions, Claims, and Communications, we have a letter from County Board Supervisor Brandon Buchanan regarding his uh, resignation from his position, and I've given you the update on filling that position. Uh, we have a rezoning request from, uh, regarding the Town of Drammen that will come forward in a future uh, meeting. 
Uh, third, we have a proclamation proclaiming September 21st as International Day of Peace in Eau Claire County. At this point, I'll ask the county clerk to read the proclamation, which you have in your packet. Proclaiming 2019 International Day of Peace in Eau Claire County. Whereas the issue of peace embraces the deepest hopes of all people and remains humanity's guiding inspiration. And whereas in 1981, the United Nations proclaimed that the International Day of Peace be devoted to commemorating and strengthening the ideals of peace both within and among all nations and peoples. And whereas it, the United Nations expanded the observance of the International Day of Peace in 2001 to include the call for a day of global <clears throat> ceasefire and nonviolence and invited all nations and people to honor a cessation of hostilities for the duration of the day. And whereas there is growing support within our county for the observance of the International Day of Peace, which affirms a vision of our world at peace and fosters cooperation between individuals, organizations, and nations, and whereas global crisis impel all citizens to work toward converting humanity's noblest aspirations for world peace into a practical reality for future generations. Now, therefore, <clears throat> Eau Claire County Board, on behalf of the entire County Board, do hereby recognize September 21st as the International Day of Peace throughout the County of Eau Claire and acknowledge the efforts of all government agencies, organizations, schools, places of worship, and individuals in our city to commemorate in the appropriate manner the International Day of Peace to help establish a global day of peace in our homes, our communities, and between nations. Uh I'm sure you've noticed that the Supervisor Bates's name is is there, and I, there's absolutely no problem with having it stay there, so I would prefer that it would. So at this point, the Chair looks for a motion to approve the proclamation as it stands. Motion by Supervisor Neiman, second by Supervisor Anderson. Uh, any questions or discussion regarding it? Uh, we can do this, I believe, also by voice vote. All those in favor of the proclamation indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed by nay. It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, the recognition and appreciation from the Eau Claire City Council for our permission for the use of our facilities while they were renovating their facilities. Uh, next on our agenda is first reading of ordinances by committees. A reminder to you that the, these are first readings uh, so we will bring them onto the, the board floor and they will be referred to the next meeting for deliberation and consideration. First is file number 48. This ordinance makes changes to section two and three of the county code regarding confirmation of meetings and the process for payment. Okay, this will now be referred to the next uh, meeting and we would hope that you would look at the supporting information and preparation for that. Second is file number 50. This ordinance makes changes to Section 4 of the Eau Claire County Code for fee changes in planning and development. Okay. This also will be referred to our next meeting. And finally, file number 52. To amend Section 3.20.020A3 of the Code, County Board of Supervisors Compensation. This also is referred to our next uh, meeting. Uh, we have no first reading of ordinances and resolution by members. Next, uh, in Section 10, Reports of Standing Committees, Committees, Commissions, and Boards under 2.04.160, and Second Reading of Ordinances. The Clerk has asked me to remind you to use your green sheets because we've had to cross out some items. You do have your green agenda? Okay. So the first item that we're going to consider from Committee on Administration is file number 55. Creating a special committee to serve as the building committee for the highway department building project authorized by the county board. This is resolution. So motion, motion by Supervisor Henning, second by Supervisor Bates. Um, uh, Supervisor Lavelle, you wish to speak? I'm sorry. I should have turned your microphone on. <laughs> I'm getting used to not turning it on. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On this, uh, I see who, the, who are going to be on that committee, and, and I would would like to be on that, but I would like to refer this back to Highway because there's some things on there. Is this committee going to meet for, you know, 
how we how are we going to fu fund this highway shop is one thing, and how uh, how long are we going to be, you know, meeting before we decide how much we're going to fund or when we're going to fund it or how long it's going to be before they even start. So uh, uh, maybe I'm it should sorry. be referred back to. Okay. The so highway, and that's we have my a motion. Mo I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> interrupting you. Uh, we have a motion to refer this item to the highway committee. Back to the highway committee. It's a motion requires a second. Is there a second? A second from Supervisor Chilson. Is there any discussion of the motion to refer to committee? Uh, Supervisor Wilkie. Uh, I was going to speak to the original resolution, not to referral. Okay. Any question or discussion about the motion to refer? Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on the motion to refer this item to the Highway Committee. I don't think you're going to be able to see it up on the screen, but I do see it on mine, so I'll remind anyone if they didn't. Supervisor Anton. Supervisor Coffey. Supervisor Coffey, are you still struggling with your? Yeah, it's not letting up at all right What can we do? Yeah, I didn't. There, it's coming. There it is. Now you confirm. Well, there's. Five no's, five no's, and. Um, there's 26, so 20, 21 yeses. 21 five. I. Five no's. Five nay. Uh, the motion passes. The item is referred to committee. Thank you. Uh, next, from Committee on Finance and Budget, file number 58. Approval of gift, grant, and or donation to Eau Claire County. Motion by Supervisor Leary. Second by Supervisor Wilkie. Um, explanation, Supervisor Dunning or Supervisor Pagonis? Supervisor Pagonis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a formality. Um, so basically, we've been uh, given some grants and gifts that are being absorbed into these various department budgets. Um, so all of its revenue, which means that's a good thing, um, but um, we actually, because it's a budget change, we need uh, two-thirds uh, approval. But um, I would encourage everyone to approve it because it's revenue. Thank you. Are there any questions or discussion of this item? I don't think so. I think these. I see no request to speak. Supervisors, please Addition. take your keypads in hand and vote on file 50. The eight. Supervisor Henning and Supervisor Gatlin. Um, unanimous. The vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next item from Committee on Finance and Budget is file 62. Initial resolution authorizing the borrowing of not to exceed $10 million and providing for the issuance and sale of general obligation promissory notes thereof, or therefore, excuse me. Motion. Supervisor Pagonis, second Supervisor Wilkie. Uh, explanation again, Supervisor Pagonis. Yes, please. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is, uh, Norb referenced this earlier, this is our annual borrowing for uh, capital projects that occur <coughs> during 2019. Um, the final number uh, on the resolution is 9,795,000, almost 796. Um, we actually believe it might go down a little bit before we actually um, do the final borrowing. Um, I want to say at this point in time, assuming everything um, goes well and we maintain the rating that we have had, the interest rates are very, very favorable. And so we believe that this is, uh, we're, at a, it's, we're borrowing at a very, very good time. So I would encourage your approval. 
Thank you. Thank you. I see no request to speak. No question or discussion. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file 62. Supervisor Anton and Supervisor Russell. Supervisor Coffey, could you just confirm? And Supervisor Lavelle. That is uh, 25 to 25, one. yes, one, no. The motion passes. Thank you. The next is file 53. Authorizing the cancellation of checks that are over two years old, directing that said total be transferred to the on-claim trust account and credited to the general fund. Motion, Supervisor Henning, second Supervisor Bates. Um, explanation, Supervisor Pagonis again. Uh, yeah, it'll be quick. This is a housekeeping matter. These are outstanding checks that have been outstanding for a long time. I thought we did this once before a couple years ago and cleaned up some back checks, but I think I was told recently that we haven't done this for several years. So um, uh, these are basically unclaimed checks, and so we're just asking to cancel them at this time. Questions or discussion? I see no request to speak. Su oh, I'm sorry, Supervisor Stelches. Yes, you're on. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just have a question. Uh, what what efforts have been made to contact these people? And I mean, I recognize some of the names on this list. So what if somebody comes forward later on and says, "Hey, you haven't paid me for something. Will they be issued a new check, or is this basically are they?" Uh, giving up their claim for reimbursement by doing this. I'm going to ask the finance director to respond. Is he still here? Is there someone who can respond? Catherine. Oh, Catherine. I don't think if they claim they get paid. If they come forward, they... We're having some discussion here about that. <laughs> I don't think I agree. Catherine, go ahead. One moment, please. Corporation okay. Council wants to look up the law on that question. Tim, would you address it? So the question is, is if they come forward and they ask, uh, will they get paid? There's obviously a law with regards to checks and when they become void. I don't know what the answer is offhand. I'd have to look up that law and, and respond back to the committee or the count board. Is what I, would I, can't, I can't understand what you're saying. I would imagine that some of these, after a certain time, just become void by matter of law. Supervisor Stalchus. I'm still not clear whether these people are giving, giving up the claim to the money. If they came back and presented a legitimate claim, is the answer to that yes or no, I guess? I would think that they probably... Sure. It's like... So, Supervisor Stelchus, it sounds like the answer is we'll get back to you on that. Hang on just one uh, we have some other requests to speak. I'm going to go forward with them, and if necessary, we'll come back. Supervisor Gatlin was next in line. I would defer to Finance Director. I'm, I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My question was going to be the same as Supervisor Stelges. I was wondering if these names were published anywhere for anybody to... Uh, yes. Yeah, they, they, were published published. In, yeah, they were published in the newspaper, and after that... Oh, they were published in the newspaper. After that, some did actually <laughs> contact us, and in which case we canceled the old check and made payment, and it's still open. If for some reason people come to us later and for some reason they figure it out, that process would still occur. Oh, so they still have a claim to the money. Yep, that's what they it's, they it's do. Right Typically, here. that's not been the case. Okay. Um, Supervisor Russell. I believe in the maybe finance and budget committee. The treasurer mentioned putting it into a trust, so that if somebody did come back later, they would be able to make the claim. 
we have a who knows from the finance director. <laughs> Supervisor Wilson. <coughs> Uh, my my understanding has been, past practice has been, and maybe staff can correct me if I'm wrong because I couldn't hear you real good, Norb, but my, my understanding is if these people reappear and ask for, for payment, we will cut them a new check. Is that correct or not correct? And it appears by 5964 sub E. That's referenced in the in the resolution that they have up to six years to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's okay. Push my button to speak. There we go. I'm having a hard time keeping track. Go ahead. All right. Um, I just want to point out that the resolution actually says the totals transferred to the unclaimed trust account. So that's that's in existence. That's where the money goes. So. If they return at some point, I suspect that it might be, the checks might be cut. Thank you. Are there any other questions, any other discussion on this motion? I see no other requests to speak. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file 53. Bounce them back. Supervisor Henning, Supervisor Bates, Supervisor Gatlin, and Supervisor Borboom. And Supervisor Coffey, could you confirm? Thank you, unanimous. It's unanimous vote, thank you very much. The next item is from Committee on Human Resources, file 61. Authorizing to abolish one, one FTE survey Surveyor and to create one FTE highway fiscal supervisor. Motion. Supervisor Miller, second Supervisor Gatlin. Explanation would that be Supervisor Gatlin? When, this has become overly the HR department reviews with the with the director of the department to see if the duties and responsibilities need to be changed. So the surveyor position in the highway department has been vacant for several months. And recently they lost an, two accountant positions. So in this, what they want to do is to create a fiscal supervisor and this person would be doing many of the things that we've already been discussing tonight. And that's to um, have a clear to assist the auditors and have a clear um, overview of all the fiscal activities of the highway department and to also supervisor, supervise the accountant and the fiscal clerk. We know that there's been a lot of change in staff at the state level, the Department of Transportation. So this position will help into keeping tabs on, on revenue that's due and, and revenue that becomes in late. Um, and they also be assisting the the auditors and um, pretty much adhering to what we were talking about earlier the different software programs to kind of condense into the same same fiscal system. And I would urge your support. Thank you. I see no other requests to speak. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file 61. Supervisor Gatlin and Supervisor Bates, could you confirm? Confirm. And, and Supervisor Miller. No, still waiting for Miller. Unanimous. <laughs> the vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item is file 60. Authorizing to abolish one one FTE accountant and to create one one FTE fiscal associate for. Motion, Supervisor Leary. Second, Supervisor Gatlin. Explanation, Supervisor Gatlin again. So to concur with the first position, I said they lost two accounting positions. So they were one of the positions they wanted to make the supervisor position, and this position, this one, they want to um, reduce it. Uh, pay levels and call it a fiscal associate for. And this position would be doing the busy work, the logistical work. 
fiscal work in the highway department, and I urge your support. Thank you. There, is there any question or is there any discussion? I see none. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand and vote on file 60. Supervisor Pagonis, Chilson, and Bates, and Miller. And Neiman and Dunning, could you confirm, please? Supervisor Neiman, could you confirm? Unanimous. The vote is unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item coming from Planning and Development Committee is file number 41. Amending the 1982 official zoning district boundary map for the town of Washington. Uh, this item is second reading of this ordinance, and so we are voting tonight on it. Motion. Supervisor Dunning, second. Supervisor Bourbon. Uh, explanation. Supervisor Gibson. Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm waiting for my light. Sorry. sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm running to catch right. up tonight. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. This is to rezone 11.3 acres from A2 Agriculture Residential District to the R1L Single Family Resident. And this will be attached in part of the plan trilogy single family residential division. This was, uh, Town of Washington had their public hearing. Um, it fits in with their comprehensive plan and they voted unanimously to approve this. It was recommended for approval by Planning and Development Department. Uh, Planning and Development Committee had a public hearing at our meeting and voted unanimously for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or is there any discussion on this item? I see no request to speak. Supervisors, please take your keypads in hand hmm. and vote on file 41. Supervisor Chilson, Bates, Gatlin, Smyre. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and Supervisor Lavelle. <laughs> Even Homer nods. And Supervisor Jansen, could you confirm? Okay. Um, 25 yes, one no. 25 yes, one no. The, the motion passes. Uh, the next item is aisle, aisle, file number 57. This resolution is in support of Wisconsin Draft Legislative Reference Bureau, the LRB Bill 1522-P1, that seeks to restore voting rights to people on probation and parole and decrease felony disenfranchisement in the state of Wisconsin. Motion. Supervisor Kronk. Second, Supervisor Anderson. Uh, speaking to this, Supervisor Miller. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this item actually was brought forth, uh, brought to our attention, the committee's attention, by a number of individuals in the community, a couple of whom you heard from this evening, and that it, the voting rights of individuals who have been incarcerated in this country are all over the board when it comes to how soon they can vote, if they can ever vote again, so on and so forth. The draft legislation actually has been initiated. The uh, sponsorship and author of that bill is from our area and feels that it will, and there's a companion Senate bill as well, and it'll very likely be marked up, given a number and so on, and be brought forth probably in October, if, uh, if not sooner. So therefore, our committee felt that we really wanted to bring this forth, send it on to Wisconsin legislators and the governor and the respective individuals. As you heard tonight, in particular, the one individual he committed a crime back in 2010, and since then he's been a grad from UW-Eau Claire. He's gainfully employed. 
He owns a home and pays property taxes, but he can't vote. And he's, yes, thank you, and on top of that, he's a veteran. And it's just sad when you think about that across the state. Well, I know the, the statistics were back in 2016, but it was estimated there's about 64,000 people in Wisconsin that potentially fit that bill. And I just find it as one who obviously, as we all do, rely on people coming to the booth and electing us to represent them and rely on people to contact us with concerns and questions and what have you, find it just very disheartening to know that there might be those individuals out there, but they can't reach out, won't reach out to us because they can't vote anyway. So the bottom line, I'm, without going on any further, I hope you had an opportunity to read the whole resolution, and I, I, I really encourage your support. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Anderson. Uh, I'd just like to add that the reduction of disenfranchisement of any kind uh, directly strengthens our society, and that I would also urge your support. I, I'm sorry, Supervisor Anderson, I can't hear. Oh. Oh, I would, I'll get a little closer. I would just like to add that the reduction of disenfranchisement of any, co of any kind directly uh, strengthens our society, and I would urge your support on this. Thank you. Supervisor Kronk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, when I look at this resolution, and I was also at the Judiciary and Law Committee and, and was able to hear Representative Emerson and others speak, I think about this not only as a county board supervisor and the, the community members that I represent, but I also think about it as a mother and a grandmother and the legacy that we are choosing to bring forward to you know our children, our grandchildren, and many generations to come. And I think it would be really remiss if we didn't at least mention and talk about that a lot of these laws and policies are rooted in racism and discrimination. We saw some of the statistics. Um, and I think if you were here during um, my moment of reflection, I did read from Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, and I think it was really clear how voting disenfranchisement has just morphed through time. So I too, you know, I, I appreciated the two folks that came forward and spoke. Um, I think we do expect people to come and you know, be participating in our communities and pay taxes and work and do all of those things, but yet we don't allow them to vote. And I think that's just fundamentally wrong. And to Super and or Supervisor Anderson's point, it really doesn't promote public safety. It does just the opposite. Uh, there is, you know, studies that show that people are more likely to commit crimes or re-enter into the criminal legal system when they aren't able to vote and feel as a part of their community. And I also, I've been thinking a lot about um, the student that had racist language, hateful language on her door at UWEC that I'm sure we've seen in the news. And I think when we, when we, we can say we abhor that, activity and that behavior, but then when we still continue to perpetuate laws and policies that are rooted in discrimination, we can't have it both ways. So I really hope that um, we not only support this, but we support it unanimously. So thank you. Thank you. Supervisor McKinney. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, it was about 15 years ago, Supervisor Bates <laughs> I sat next to her on a bus going over to Minneapolis to uh, observe mental health court. Do you remember that, Colleen? And this county has always set an example of being a forerunner on criminal justice reform. I think this is just a tiny, tiny step that we can continue to be a leader in um, showing that kind of support that we've shown throughout those 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McKinney. I see no other requests to speak. Supervisors, please take in hand your keypads and vote. Um, I forgot the number, file. Uh, 57. <laughs> file 57. <clears throat> Supervisor Anton and Supervisor Dunning. Thank you. Uh, 25 yes, one no. 25 yes, one no. The motion passes.
We have reached the end of our agenda. We are now adjourned. Um, can I get you to sign those two? Which sure. Four, um,